Evening. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, today, uh, my name is um, Osi Egbia here. Um, so today we'll be looking at uh, building fabric and structured maintenance. Building fabric and structural maintenance. Um, why we are looking at this topic today is to help us have a, a view of um, the makeup of a structure or a building that we normally uh, would work with. It's only good for us to understand the makeup of what we see and how that functions. Uh, there are different elements in a building, which we are going to look at and um, try and um, just have brief discussions on it so that, um, especially for those of us that are, are, are not in, are not uh, our background course is not in the area of like engineering or building technology or generally in the built environment and um, somehow found themselves in management. Uh, they just need to have a general oversight of um, uh, the different um, elements of a building. Uh, generally and normally, a building is made up of two major aspects. Two major aspects. You have the substructure and the superstructure. You have the substructure and the superstructure. The substructure is everything that happens under the ground. The foundation, whether you have basement one, basement two, basement three, basement four, everything that is happening under the ground that is not visible to the eyes is called the substructure. And everything that you see on top uh, from the ground floor, whether you call it first floor, second floor, third floor, or thereabout, uh, all of those are called the superstructure. Uh, those are the two basic areas uh, a building is divided into. It's just for us to note so that um, and these terminologies, uh, if you're in the boot, boot industry, uh, will become very familiar with you. Uh, generally, we'll be looking at um, uh, these two different parts, the foundations, we'll look at foundation, what's the makeup of foundation, different types of foundation, we'll look at walls, different types of walls, We look at ceilings and roof, we look at floors, we look at windows, we look at doors. These are the general elements that make up any structure that you'll be working with. Now, these elements are, like I said, they are the basic of uh, all the structure. Every structure must have, should have this element in one form or the other. Um, by way of introduction, building maintenance is essential to prolong the building life cycle and reduce the company's loss. When a building is neglected, defects can occur, which may result in expensive and unavailable damage of the building fabric or structure. It is not only the building that suffers loss, the inheritors of the buildings are also exposed to uh, great danger. Now, you will observe that um, in buildings, as it were, if uh, for those of us that have, uh, have this tradition of traveling home, or traveling to the village at once in a while. So if you have a structure there, either your dad could have a building there or you have a building there yourself. Uh, and when you go back home uh, to build it, uh, you will notice something very funny that no matter how you clean that building when you leave, probably you traveled, uh, you traveled uh, every end of year, no matter how you clean that building at the end of the year, uh, when you are leaving to Lagos in January, by the time you return, any time, probably June, July, you will discover that you will need to still clean again. And you also notice that um, the building itself uh, will have some defects here and there that you may probably need to fix. Uh, this is because when the building is not occupied, somehow it deteriorates faster. That's why when you are doing a building construction, by the time that's why there's a point we call practical completion. Not uh, we don't say complete completion. It's a practical completion where the building is finished in such a manner that it is habitable. Even if you have one or two snags, you have to fix because if you wait till the building is completely finished, it will never be finished because you will always have snags to fix. You always have one or two things to fix as much as that building is not being occupied. So it is very important for you as a facility manager to know this so that uh, by the time you are working with structures uh, and when you notice that the buildings are not um, occupied, uh, you know exactly what to do. Foundation. 
Foundation is that part of the structure that transmits the load of the building to the soil. Is that part of the structure that has direct contact with the soil, with the soil. and um, that part is called foundation. Uh, there are broadly four types of foundation. We have the strip foundation, which is also referred to as the traditional foundation type. We have the part foundation, we have the raft foundation, and we also have the pie foundation. Um, strip foundation is a particular, is a, is, is a traditional type of foundation where you just dig the ground, you pour some concrete into it for a point, and you start setting blocks up. Uh, these are the traditional ways of building bungalows, uh, here and there in our houses, in the village, wherever we find ourselves. Uh, there are two types of strip foundation, rather there are even more than two, but just basically two types. We have the no, three types, sorry. We have the normal one, which is here, uh, the regular one that we see. We have the wide strip foundation where the strip, the concrete strip is wider. And we have the deep strip foundation where the concrete strip is deeper. I also have the part foundation. Uh, if you are taking time at all to look at uh, street lights or um, um, some all these billboards or signs, road signs, you will see that there is a, always a square concrete um, block that the street light sits upon. That thing that you see is called a pad foundation. That's a pad foundation. This is a typical example of a pad foundation. Pad foundation traditionally is used to transmit a load of columns uh, down to the soil. Uh, it's also, you can use that in combination with strip foundation or a raft foundation. You have raft foundation. Raft foundation is the one that you do completely in concrete and is normally used where the load bearing capacity of the soil is very weak, where the load bearing capacity of the soil is very weak. It helps to give a stable platform because the raft foundation is almost like a concrete stable, such that uh, when it sits on the foundation or rather on the soil, uh, it conducts a little bit of stability so that the building does not sink. Normally, when the building uh, load capacity is low, raw foundation is used to give a little bit of stability to the building so that it doesn't sink. And it does not just sink, it also does not disintegrate while uh, it's doing that also. The next one will have pie foundation. Pie foundation is traditionally used for high rise buildings and where also the the, uh, the load bearing capacity of the soil is extremely bad. When it is extremely bad, where regular foundation cannot work, uh, uh, pie foundation is what is used. And also, pie foundation is used to also transmit all the load down to the uh, bedrock of uh, the soil, the most dense area of the soil. So it goes straight down almost to the foundation bed of, of the earth and then uh, from there, uh, you start uh, piling, and then there's something we we'll call a pie cap, which sits on top. And uh, they, are, they are popularly used for bridges, for high road, uh, sorry, high rise buildings, and so on and so forth. So, uh, for, for those of you that walk around the marina as this, you will notice that uh, if you see what's going on uh, with the train they are building and the bridges they are doing there. You notice that after they, for a while they'll be hitting or digging the ground, and after a while they'll start casting concrete coming up. The stuff they are doing into the ground is a pile foundation, which they are drilling piles into the ground to hit the bedrock, and then uh, when they, when they are done, they put the columns on top. We also have apart from foundation after foundation, the next level we have our walls. Uh, walls. A wall is that is a structure that defines an area and carries a load or provides shelter or security. Wall in a building, sorry, wall in buildings that form fundamental walls in buildings, uh, they form the fundamental part of the superstructure or, or separate interior rooms. Walls are used as a, also partition to define spaces in a given uh, building. It's also used for security purpose and also used to also transmit load. Uh, we also have two types of walls. Uh, we have um, load bearing walls and non load bearing walls. Load bearing walls are the walls that carries load that transfer the building's load to the foundation. Uh, either they are internal or external, but non load bearing walls uh, do not exactly carry load. Um, 
from the building. Do, normally during construction, uh, the two types of, um, of floors are either used by the structural engineers. Where you use load bearing walls, um, you, do, you, don't, you are not at liberty to touch any of the walls because all the walls are structural. They are all structural walls. But when they are, they are non-load bearing walls or party walls, like we will call them, the walls are not structural. They don't carry any load. They are just used to uh, delineate spaces or interior spaces as it may be. And the structures are normally built on a frame structure where you have only columns and beams transmitting the load of every floor to the foundation. You have columns and beams transmitting the loads of the floors down to the foundation and also the load of the wall itself down to the foundation. Uh, so necessarily you don't need the walls as load bearing walls. If you, if for those of us that uh, would know the old Jack on the houses, a lot of them were built with load bearing walls. Uh, those, those buildings do not have columns and beams. They do not have columns and beams. It is, uh, the only thing they have are probably the intels, but it is the walls that carry most of the load from every floor and transmit it down to the foundation. That's why uh, when you live in those houses, sorry, you are not allowed to, uh, you no know, matter the kind of renovation you want to do, you are not allowed to touch any walls in those houses so that uh, you don't allow the building collapse because all the walls are traditional load bearing walls. Other types of walls include party walls, firewalls, shear walls. Party walls just separate. Uh, uh, just separate the units of spaces in between the building. Uh, they are good for sound insulation and also a little bit of fire insulation. Firewalls are majorly erected uh, for fire resistance for areas where you require special fire resistance. Those walls are normally made of concrete or very high fire resistant materials are used for those walls such that um, once there is a fire, the, build, the wall will be able to hold the fire back for a while before the fire service comes in. Also, we have the shear walls. Shear walls are actually used to withstand uh, wind effect or quakes. Um, so normally areas where we have very high wind, areas are very close to uh, the seashore or to the ocean that has very close proximity to the ocean and normally use a lot of shear walls, especially when it has to do with high rise buildings. It helps to stabilize the building and to withstand the wind effect that may come uh, from uh, uh, the ocean uh, to the building, whereby if there's that wind comes, the, the, the shear wall uh, is able to transmit the vibration that will come from the effect of the wind straight down to the foundation. Movable partition walls, uh, that's sometimes for, for those of us that go to churches, or maybe it, uh, worship areas, depending on the one you go to. Sometimes you see these party walls that are movable, especially where you have children sections or there about the daily classes for them. And even in some schools, you use that. Uh, in some areas, you use that. You have partition, partition uh, movable partition walls. Just use that. Just use three different rooms, uh, and uh, they are non load bearing walls. You have cutting walls or building fatals. Cutting walls becoming increasingly popular for high rise building where you have uh, glass walls. Those building facades, generally made of glass, you have cutting walls, and you also have a stainless stained glass uh, finish and uh, different types of wall finishes. You have stained glass finish for uh, things like cathedrals or churches. They normally have something like that. You have the pebble finish walls. Uh, this is when you use pebbles. Small pebbles are pasted into the wall uh, with use of mortar. Uh, these are normally used around where you have a lot of water bodies because pebbles. Uh, sometimes picked out of the water. So they have a little bit of resilience against the effects of water. So, and also has a way of protecting the wall. Um, we also have the plaster cement finish for wall where you just know the normal plaster or rendering of the wall with uh, water, sand and cement uh, uh, plaster, which is just app applied properly uh, to just finish the wall. Uh, sometimes you paint that, sometimes you just leave it the way it is. They also have marble finish on the wall. This is where you use marble uh, 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 stones, uh, well polished to finish your wall. You also have the plaster of Paris POP finish on walls. You have tiles as cladding. Uh, you know how that fits, especially in areas like toilets, 
in kitchens, and sometimes on the external walls or internal walls, depending on what material you wish to use and the effect you hope to get from the final finish and the look of the wall. Types of wall materials you have for internal wall materials includes uh, plaster boards. Plaster boards are what some people will call generally POP boards uh, used for partition walls. You have bricks, uh, you have the mortar, you have plaster used for repairing damaged walls in walls and uh, usual for uh, uh, fillers, those are plasters. Uh, the normal regular brick is what you know and the mortar is what is used to uh, put them to all together. You have tiles um, also that's being used as materials used for uh, bathrooms, toilet and kitchens, like I mentioned earlier. You have um, wall cladding, wall, uh, wood cladding. The wood, you can use wood as cladding on walls, especially if you're for those uh, that are exposed to uh, uh, law firms, chambers and they're about or courts. A lot of those areas are, are cladded. And because wood itself, has a very high rate of uh, 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 sound insulation. So uh, these are the materials that are mostly used in those areas because there are areas where they make a little of noise, but they need the noise to be within the room so that when discussions are being are happening, uh, especially in the country, it doesn't filter out so much. And for law offices, uh, the need of privacy and to also note that your discussion that you're probably having in the client is not being, uh, nobody is, is dropping on your conversation. Uh, to take out uh, valuable and very important information out of that conversation. Uh, uh, conversation. You also have uh, wallpapers as finished for uh, decorative walls. Uh, it is used for decorating the wall. Uh, it's becoming increasingly popular in Nigeria. It wasn't before, but now it's becoming increasingly popular uh, because of its use in most areas. Internal wall finishes, you have the metal cladding, not what some people call a local bond. It's also used for that. It's also water resistance, it's strong depending on the thickness and the particular type of a local bond you use. You also have the stone cladding, uh, which may, you, you can use that, uh, it gives you a little bit of attractive finish. You also have the use of plastic cladding, uh, where uh, the material finish is made of plastic and uh, is being installed on the uh, studs and uh, tracks, uh, they are, which are anchored to the walls as a form of finish. But cladding generally uh, is when you're applying one material over another, to provide a skin or a layer used for thermal insulation, weather resistance, and improving the building appearances as it's made. That's what cladding does. Uh, function of a wall. Functions of a wall. Provides protection from weather. Allows for proper demarcation of any given area. Gives barrier to sound, sound, uh, Relation separates spaces in the interiors of a building and gives strength and stability to the building. Also, that is where you are using load bearing walls. Reduces uh, spread of fire from building space to other building space. Um, that's one of the things wall does, especially where you have uh, fire walls, uh, walls that have high fire resistance, uh, such that if, if if there's fire in a particular building, if the Fire, the wall is a firewall or has very high fire resistance. It will hold the fire down for a long time so that the building, the, the fire does not penetrate into the other building. It's very important to know that. It also gives a little bit of uh, the thermal insulation. Um, for here, it, it's, uh, it's not very pronounced. It's when you are in areas where the temperature is young, that's when you will appreciate this part of what wall does. You will understand when uh, it's snowing and everywhere is cold. You only see people running in uh, because the wall uh, gives a little bit of that while they also connect heaters to the wall to heat up the wall so you can heat up the spaces. Uh, that's normally what they do, heat walls, heat floors, uh, but just uh, for just a short period, the wall gives a little bit of thermal insulation, whether hot or cold. And when the walls are properly done, uh, it's able to manage the weather transition. Uh, a lot of buildings where they don't use uh, hollow blocks, that's one of the advantages of using hollow block or brick, bricks. It helps to control the weather. If you have ever lived in a mud house, you will discover that once it is extremely hot outside that you go into the mud, mud house. Inside the mud house is not as hot as outside because the mud has a very good thermal insulation. It has a way of reducing the intensity of the heat from outside 
going inside. And vice versa, once it is cold at night and you are inside the 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 uh, the, the, the mud hut, you discover that inside is warm enough for you to stay. It's quite comfortable and it's cool enough for also. So it doesn't quickly transmit, uh, especially heat from outside to inside. Uh, for for hollow block walls, the vacuum in between the holes, in between the walls, the bricks, uh, the the blocks, helps to control the movement of heat and cold, such that it reduces the transmission of heat from outside to inside the building. That's why when you have uh, such thermal build, uh, sorry, such hollow blocks for houses, uh, inside when, it is, when the intensity of the, the sun is high, it's not always as hot as that. But if you have the, the solid block, it's very, very hot. It just transmits it directly. Also provides security, that's walls provides a little bit of security such that uh, when you are sleeping, you can lock your doors because you have walls around. Imagine where you only have doors and don't have walls. And you, after very, after finishing your house, when, before you even sleep, so the things that you put in your house will go missing because who will just be passing and they'll just come in and they'll be picking whatever they like. But once it is walled around and properly done, uh, people, will, you have a little bit of security of your life and also properties. Wall maintenance planning. One of the things that you must do as a facility manager is that um, every day it must become like a routine in your facility. Don't get tired of doing that because uh, uh, the day you may not do it, maybe that's the day disaster will start happening, but God forbid. Uh, so you should always do it. One of the things you must always do is that you do thorough inspection. Normally, I always advise for facility managers when you take up an, a facility, there's what, um, which I, I think you should have been taught, is called the facility uh, audit or the, uh, the uh, facility uh, as, uh, is the facility audit anyway. Um, what's the right word for that? So, I. I facility I, condition I, assessment. Yes, 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 yes. That's um, the facility condition assessment. Thank you very much. And that's the right word for it. You must always do it at the beginning of every building or every uh, facility you handle. Uh, whether it has been done before you came in or you came in, it's not been done. Uh, you must always ask that it's been done. If it has not been done for your own health, it's better you do it to ascertain the level of that facility uh, at the time you are taking it over uh, so that you'll be able to monitor it from then, have all the records, uh, well um, uh, documented and sent in to the right people for management to look at and then give comments on whatever they think and um, how uh, those things are, the facility is at the point where you are taking it over. It is from that point that you begin to monitor. It is from that point you begin to monitor. You will go around every day, every two days. You inspect all the walls critically. Uh, you look out for uh, movement and walls or cracks. Uh, check for certain building settlements. Uh, also check for uh, that the, the landscapes around the walls are properly managed. Now, when you are looking at walls, sometimes you may see what we call uh, cracks on the walls. Um, there are different types of cracks. There are structural cracks and they are just surface cracks or what we call plaster cracks. Surface cracks or plaster cracks are due to sometimes uh, when the building uh, uh, the plastering of the building when they don't use the proper mix of sand or the proper plaster sand. If that is not done, it will the building the plaster will crack, and once it starts cracking over a period of time, it will fall off. Uh, it, it's easy to maintain anyway. Uh, for such facility that has that problem, what you we really would do is uh, just to hack out the plaster and then. Uh, Use get the particular uh, good uh, uh, plaster sand, mix it very well, and then they apply it, uh, the plaster before it is finished and then painted. But when it, the, the crack is structural, you probably see a single line that will be going from top to bottom. And it becomes very critical if that line, that crack line, tears through the foundation. If it tears through the foundation, then you have an emergency on your hand. But if it doesn't go through the foundation, it's just for you to monitor it, probably if it's building settlement and um, see how the building settles. After a while, it should stop. But when it doesn't stop and you see that diversion, that plaster begins to, in the, the width of the, 
of the clock increases by, let's say every two, two days or every week, uh, it should bring a stronger uh, concern to you. And then you need to invite some expert to look at the building and so they can take appropriate action uh, for all that. So it is very important for you to inspect your facility, inspect the walls in the facility, and ensure that uh, the walls are in good condition, not just uh, physically, uh, but when you look at it for cracks, to ensure that it is okay. Uh, wall maintenance, uh, flaking paint. When paint, uh, when you have damp in walls, flaking paint and chalking paint. Flaking paint normally happens when there is damp in the wall and the damp dries out. Once you do that cycle uh, for two, three times, after a while, the paint that you use for the wall will start flaking and then it starts uh, going up. Once you see that in the building, uh, you probably look at where you have any form of leakage or maybe the wall is just soaking water arbitrarily when it rains. Uh, that which that should not happen. That is also due to bad, you, bad uh, plastering uh, sand. It affects the wall. Once that is happening, what you probably will have to do is uh, scrape out the paint, the paint uh, uh, thoroughly, uh, use some paper to sand it properly or use a sanding machine to sand it out. Immediately you sand that out, uh, you add a little bit of uh, waterproofing material on that wall so that it will not absorb water anymore. And then you apply your paint or you screed with waterproofing, uh, screeding material, external screeding material so that it does it, it helps to protect the wall from absorbing water. And then you can paint and then your paint should be able to last uh, for a longer time. For chalking paint also, uh, apart from uh, uh, the, the, the wall soaking water and then drying out through the uh, surface, uh, through the circle. Chalking paints are also as a result of either the effect of the weather or a result of bad paint, low quality paints. Once you use low quality paints, the paints will chalk after a while, after you have installed it, and then it will begin to have issues. Uh, when you have molds in buildings where uh, it's normally due to, to, to leakage or damp, dampness on the wall. Now, there's something that's very important at this stage, I need to tell you. Uh, most buildings uh, in around uh, uh, Lekki, Axis, Victoria, Island, Ikoi, they are newly built, they, they have a lot of this problem. And uh, that's capillary rise, where water will be rising through the wall and you'll be seeing the stain of the water, especially during rainy season. In dry season, you will see it. Rainy season, you see that. Uh, that problem uh, is due to bad workmanship when they were doing the foundation. There's what we call waterproof, dampproof uh, membrane. Uh, which is uh, the DPC or DPM, the improved cost or the improved membrane, uh, which is normally placed at the foundation. I'll show you that on the diagram I showed you earlier on the foundation. Yes, uh, this diagram, you see, a, you, you should have this slide with you. Uh, I hope you can see this projection. You see the DPC uh, uh, shown there. It's normally placed to go through the wall, the foundation wall, and also through the slab uh, before the walls are placed. The same thing here, uh, it, it's always done that. It's almost, it's always done so that to, it, it, that DPC is normally like a nylon-like material that is uh, placed uh, on, the, on the walls before it is done. It helps to protect the wall uh, against uh, capillary rise in most buildings. So it's very important to you the, uh, 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 ensure that um, that is uh, installed for material in case you are, you, are, you are supervising any construction project now. It's very important that that is done uh, in the uh, place at the foundation level before the ground floor slab is done, which you will call the German floor. And always ensure that you have German floor done in your foundation of your building. You has also have a way of protecting the building and having giving the building a little bit of structural stability. Uh, once you have capillary rise happening, sometimes it's difficult to maintain. No matter how you scrape that wall, uh, paint, it will still happen. Normally, there are treatments for that form of um, effect. Uh, there's this uh, 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 chemical that is injected into the wall around. The wall will be cut at that at a level of, let's say, 300 away from the foundation or just uh, in, from inside. And then the, the chemical will be injected into the walls. The chemical, I don't know if we know uh, these uh, baby diapers or uh, ladies should be, know, should be used to um, their pads um, that soaks water and uh, soaks um, uh, urine or whatever it soaks. Uh, it doesn't uh, leak out. It just swells. 
and that's because inside that um, uh, pad or those uh, uh, diapers, there are these uh, chemicals that mainly they absorb water, it crystallizes. Uh, and then when it dries out, it, it, it goes back to its normal state. It's that kind of chemical that is put into the wall so that it prevents the water from uh, going out. Immediately the water comes in com contact with the chemical, it forms crystals so that it doesn't go out. And then when it begins to dry out, it dries out uh, to the normal level. Once that is applied, the wall is properly scraped, a bitumenous uh, layer is painted over the wall, undercoat is applied, and then uh, the paint is applied uh, so that uh, the wall is um, taken care of. But in situations where you have leaking uh, pipes or gutters coming into the wall, what you are expected to do is to ensure that you stop every form of leakage, allow the wall dry out properly, and then you uh, begin to scrape uh, and uh, uh, apply your undercoat and then you begin to paint. Sometimes you have a corrosion on uh, some pipes or some wall due to uh, salt in salt in the sand that's probably where they are. And when salt comes in contact with water on the wall, it begins to cause some level of corrosion. Uh, what you normally would do is that uh, you, you would scrape out those areas where you have that uh, corrosion. If it's very bad, you scrape out deeply and you plaster with waterproofing uh, cement, waterproof cement, uh, to help so that it doesn't happen so much again. And then you screed over that and you paint. Uh, when the sealant's getting weak, once you have some areas where you have sealant, especially around windows or jointed areas, uh, once the sealants are weak, is a point where leakages could come into the building. So it's just for us to take out that skis, the sealant that are bad, and then uh, uh, restore the sealant and ensure that it's done. Uh, that's for walls. Then we'll go to ceilings and roof. Types of ceilings, you have the acoustic ceilings. Uh, these are good for sound insulation. Uh, it is not commonly used as uh, it contains asbestos. That's, if you, I don't know if you remember those asbestos board that we used to use in our old houses. Asbestos have been bound, bound in Nigeria because it's cancerous. Uh, uh, we don't use that anymore for ceiling works. But the form of ceiling is, is actually an acoustic material uh, because of asbestos, because it's cancerous, it doesn't bound it. You have also uh, dry, dry wall ceilings. That's when you're using uh, uh, these plasterboards, uh, which is commonly used in residential areas or the general uh, POP. You have the suspended ceilings, which are used in offices. You have cathedral ceilings, which are found in churches uh, because of the way the churches is configured. Different types of roof. You have the flat roof and the hip roof. Now, these are the two major types, but it's not broken into uh, subunits, uh, uh, which we will see after now. The subunits are you have the gable roof, which is the one that goes up on two sides. You have the, the clip gable roof where it goes up and at the point it, at the point it is clipped. You have the touch gable roof where it goes up and then part of it uh, comes down. You have the, uh, the gambrel roof. Uh, which is like gable, but is broken into different uh, two, uh, four different parts. You have the hip roof. The hip roof is when all the four sides uh, go up at a particular time. You have the mustard roof, uh, where the four side goes up, and it's as if you now have a, a hip roof on top. Uh, you have the shed roof. That's the one that what we normally call a linto, uh, sorry, a mono pitch. It's just like um, uh, half of a gable that comes down. And you have the flat roof that is relatively flat. Uh, uh, those are the different elements and different types of stuff. It's just good for you to note that. Um, uh, factors for uh, selection of ceiling um, finish. One of the things that's, uh, that's used, one of the factors is the type of the, the floor type, the type of floor finish. Sometimes the lifestyle uh, or the lifespan, sorry, of the material you want to use, the durability of the material, uh, it's fire resistance also determines uh, the kind of roof you use. The appearance of the ceiling itself determines that, and the factors, the function of the building also determines that. Uh, safety of the building occupants uh, also determines that. Factors for selecting roof finishes. How strong the finish is, its ability to transverse, uh, transverse uh, light, the cost and how attractive it is, or the load of the roof itself. Sometimes these are the different factors that uh, is used for the selection of the roof uh, that you use in buildings. 
are the types of roof finish. You have plastic roof roofing sheets. You have corrugated uh, galvanized roofing sheets. Those are the former ones you call aluminum, uh, zinc, zinc, zinc. That's it. Uh, the fiberglass sheets. Uh, that's also the polycarbon sheets. You have the mandarin uh, uh, tiles, which are just uh, they are set on top of the uh, the roof, which is not popular here in the country. Ceiling materials. You have wood. Uh, wood uh, uh, boards, uh, commonly used for structure for general uh, general structures of the building. You have the plaster, the regular plaster. When you plaster the surface with mortar, you have plaster board or POP boards. You have the wooden panels or planks. You have stencil. They are also used. You have the metal ceiling tiles, uh, uh, very easy to install. Uh, also metal suspended ceiling roofing materials. You have the asphalt. Uh, which are just uh, it's just poured on on the roof surfaces uh, for residential building. It's not we don't use that in Africa so much, but in Europe they used to use it. You have the wooden uh, stakes uh, where the the, the woods are broken and cut into smaller stakes, and then they are arranged uh, on the on the pole lines of the of the of the roofing material. It goes it has a very good weather proof uh, because of the overlapping areas that, that you have. You have the metal um, roof. Which is the normal one we are used to the copper, the tin, the zinc, the steel, roofing, mineral roofing are all metals. Ceiling repairs. Water leakage is a major source of ceiling damage. And uh, identify this, identify and stop the source of water leakage. You know, um, just generally speaking, normally once you have leakage on the ceiling, it's very difficult to handle, especially when. Uh, you use, uh, there's what we call hollow clip pots, when that is used for the floor slabs and you have ceiling underneath. Once there is water leakages, the water travels through the rib of that uh, hollow clay pot and goes to appear somewhere else. And sometimes uh, con electrical conduit pipes are also, also carries water. Once there is leakage and leakage goes into the electrical conduit pipe, it will carry the water down to the areas where uh, you do not expect, you are not even sure that uh, the waters are. So, um, so it is where you need to carefully check it and then you walk around that. Um, you allow the, the, you check for where the leakages are, ensure you fix the leakage allow the roof and the ceiling to dry out before you can do any work, before you replace it. Once it dries out, you take out the damaged area, scrape out the parts that are bad, and then you uh, you fix it back, allow, uh, leave the, the ceiling uh, there still for a while. Uh, then you do your painting or screeding over, sand it, and make sure it is smooth, and then you apply uh, your paint. Roof repairs. Damage is usually as a result of storm or heavy downpour. Sometimes um, when accessing the essence of uh, the damage, first of all, you need to assess the damage, the essence of the damage on the roof. Uh, if there are any leakages, uh, check for holes. Once there are no holes, check where it's leaking from. Uh, there's something that happens when you're installing aluminum sheets, long span aluminum roofing sheets. Uh, once the the roofing sheet is of a low grade. You are going to have a lot of leakages afterwards because when there is strong wind or rain, it will pull off the sheet or move the sheet and then it becomes broken and then there will be leakage. And sometimes there's what we call the lapping of the aluminum sheet, the lapping of the aluminum sheet. A lot of people do single lapping instead of double lapping. You have to do that double lapping. Double lapping has a way of protecting the aluminum sheet from lifting up when there is heavy rain. It has more resistance at that point in time. Uh, when you notice all the, the, the damages to where the roof are, fix it up and then you seal it over. Once that is done, you test with water flowing or wait for rainwater to ensure that the, work, the, the roof doesn't leak anymore. Uh, we look at floors. Floors, you have different types of floors. You have laminate floors, you have tiled floors, uh, you have hardwood floor. You have carpet floor based on the material. You have the uh, ceramic floor tiles. You have the marble floor tiles. And uh, uh, each of these type of floor, depending on where uh, you want to use them, 
uh, it's very, it depends on also the quality of what you want to achieve from the different type of floor. Laminate floor, uh, it has stain resistant. And there, there is this after a lot of, um, uh, some, some of these wooden floors are laminate. They are laminated, the such materials are after they are assembled, assembled you just see them shining and uh, the laminated material over them is quite water resistant and also stain resistant. We are very conversant with tile. Tiles depend on the kind of tile. Uh, it's good for high traffic areas. We also have um, hardwood where you have parquet floor. The, the woods are just put on the floor and then it's, it's a good floor finish. Also, you have the carpet, the traditional uh, rug that you use uh, in, your, in your homes and your different houses. Uh, and then you have the ceramic floor tiles, you have the marble floor tiles. These are different tiles, uh, floor finishes that you probably use for your floors, depending on the durability that you want to achieve or how your, your cost, how you can manage cost using the particular uh, tile uh, to do the finish. And then you have a floor structure, you have suspended floors. Uh, suspended floors, Suspended floors uh, are used uh, where you're made up of uh, two materials, concrete and timber, depending on where it is being used. And sometimes they use that for balconies or for, um, uh, what's it called, for IT rooms and all that. Uh, carpets are placed over the suspended floors and spread over it. Uh, sometimes very good for it to use that, depending on the type. You have the solid floor, uh, made up of different layers of materials, the sub base, uh, especially for ground floor, you have sub base, you have concrete, cement, screed, sand, uh, uh, the DPC uh, for insulation as it were, as we have uh, discussed earlier on. Floor structures, you have raised floor, this normally is around the IT areas, uh, balconies, balconies uh, where the buildings are attached. Uh, the balcony is attached to the view. They have glass floor floors. It's not very popular around there, but some people uh, use that. You have the spirit floor, which is used for indoor games area, for basketball, indoor games, uh, long tennis and all that. You see that if you go to those sports area, there are some special floors. Those, that's the kind of floor that is used for it. Floor coverings, you have the soft floor covering, which has to do with the rugs and the carpets that you normally use. They are warm and um, uh, difficult to maintain. That's one of the problems of that. Uh, you have the resilient floor, which are made of rubber floor or uh, vinyl sheets. You have the hard floor. These are more durable, but they're expensive. You have concrete finished floor. There's some floors that are made with pure concrete and properly, properly treated. It's very nice and looks very good. You have ceramic tiles, like you know, you have the granite tiles, you have the marble tiles, vitrified tiles, you have the brick finish. I have the terrazzo. Terrazzo is not as popular as it used to be, but used to be very popular in those days. Uh, floor problems, you have uh, uh, where you have the quickie uh, of wooden uh, floors in certain areas when the joints of the floor of the wooden packet are losing formation or losing balance. Uh, it, when it begins to shift, you have that kind of problem. Once you have that, you need to fix it back, put the joints together and probably screw them up together. You have vib floor vibration. When floor vibration due to heavy steps, uh, sometimes uh, this happens once uh, with tiles when uh, the tiles are not properly fixed. After a while, the tiles begin to bulk. So that when you're stepping on, you'll be feeling the hollow part after rounding it. Or when you have so much vibration happen around, around buildings around, then the, the floor tiles begin to uh, float. Uh, you know that, so when that happens, you'll be feeling that vibration, which is not always good, it's discomforting. You take out those areas, uh, take out the screeds, we screed, and then you fix it up. Um, floor borders, uh, having gaps. Once you have gaps around floor borders, uh, where you have the joists or the skirtings that are falling off, uh, you probably just fix that. Or when you have the, what to call grout that is between tiles losing up, uh, you probably need to uh, regrout wooden borders, cracks, and uh, separate, uh, separating. Uh, when you have cracks on walls, like I'd mentioned, not just floor. When you have very deep cracks on wall, sorry, on floors, and uh, not just walls, it's cause for concern, especially when there's building settlement. And sometimes it may also be due to the fact that they do not have enough building, 
uh, expansion joints in the building. Once there are no expansion joints in the building, you have building cracks all over the building. And once there are expansion joints, you also have cracks, but the only fact is that the expansion joint controls where the crack is. Once you have those expansion and the joint, the cracks will only be around where you have the expansion joint. Uh, cleaning of floors. Cleaning method depends on the floor type. For wooden floor, you clean the furniture, sweep up all the loose beds, uh, go along with. Uh, I, I think you, this, this are, these are just simple things that you can read on your own. It's just the routine that you should not for a facility manager on how to clean your floor. Uh, uh, and the routine at which you clean it, uh, clean of uh, towels and stone, remove all the dust and that uh, with broom and vacuum cleaner, spray uh, the appropriate cleaning solution on the floor, scrub the floor and mop the floor. These are things you already know. Uh, clean schedule. Normally, uh, for your cleaning schedule for floors, you're expected to daily uh, dust or sweep and mop. Weekly schedule, you're supposed to do some little bit of vacuum cleaning. Uh, monthly schedule for the, the for for four floor tiles or marble or uh, granite tiles you'll be expected to polish quarterly you're supposed to do thorough deep cleaning uh, it's something that you need to probably look at uh windows before we went to windows this is uh, almost six o'clock i'll probably come and take a time for break now and then we'll come back from the break we'll do windows and I hope that's fine with every one of us. Yes, please. Okay, so we'll take a, a five to six minutes break now, and then uh, we'll return um, afterwards. We'll return by, uh, let's say, six o'clock. Well, no, six o'clock is just three minutes, and let's say about 6.10. I will continue with windows and with doors. I hope that's fine. Yes, please. Okay, great. Now we are looking at windows. Um, we, all know, we all know what windows are, and uh, we have different types of windows. We have the fixed windows. Um, these are designed windows with no openings. You have the tint and the turn windows, built uh, either tinted inside at the top or opens inside from the hinge. Uh, yeah, that's the, those kind of windows. You also have uh, the popular casement windows that has hinge on the top and the bottom that opens out. We have the roof lanterns uh, windows, which uh, is used for daylight, which transmits light into the building. You have the skylights, skylight uh, windows. Also at the roof of the window, uh, also just sends light. It's normally flat and slopey. Uh, you have the regular sliding windows also. You have the pivot windows that's also part of it. We also have window coverings. Uh, we have uh, for internal window coverings, uh, we have applied frames, which reduce the intensity of the sun. Uh, you have solar shades. Those solar shades, uh, they just put uh, loop, like louvers, aluminum louvers, also those shades. You have the normal drippers, which are your curtains. You have the, uh, the interior louver shutters, uh, which, one, which are placed inside the window just to give a little bit of shade uh, so that the sun does, is not too intense uh, there. Then for external covering, just to protect the windows, uh, you have external louver shutters or roller shutters. Roller shutters are those doors that rules. Uh, you also have that in windows where you can just roll it down uh, to shade off the, the window and just like a form of covering for the window. External shade shaders um, you have, uh, which also protect the windows against weather and also reduce the intensity of heat that comes. External solar screens uh, are fixed also uh, to re uh, retractable that are retractable uh, depending on how it is uh, installed. We also have the uh, the roller shutters, the normal roller shutters for uh, windows. Uh, windows, window glazing. Uh, these these are these are materials that are help that help to reflect the sun depending on the intensity of the sun. So the the the, the increased solar activity. It reduces the heat that comes into the building. You can either tint uh, the the window, like normal tinting glass uh, for cars. You can also tint the glass for your windows at home. 
uh, so that it reduces the intensity of sun that comes in. You also have the reflective coat, which you call reflective windows. Uh, it just reflects the, uh, the, the solar light, the sun that hits the window. I also have the gas, glass field. This is when you have double glazing for windows. In between the double glazing, uh, is normally there's normally a gas that is feed into it. Uh, that window is normally it helps for insulation, sound insulation, and also helps to reduce the intensity of heat that comes into the building. Window frames. Uh, window frames, you can either have aluminum frames, you could have uh, fiberglass frames, you could have vinyl frames, or you could have composite material frames, depending on what you want to choose and what you want to use. Types of window materials, you have wood, that is normal, uh, which you already know. You have the aluminum, which is also popular these days. Uh, you have the vinyl, uh, is a composite material that is used uh, for windows. Windows maintenance. Use weather shield, uh, sorry, weather strippers uh, to reduce air and uh, water uh, infiltration. Uh, also regularly inspect the windows, interior and exterior, check the windows, hardware, the locks and opening mechanism to ensure that they are working well. Any exposed uh, hardware must be tightened uh, properly, securely. Always inspect the exterior uh, around the window frames, edges, the outer edges of these exterior frames to ensure that they are properly fastened. Check the windows for smooth operation, especially when you slide the window, you just roll it from one end to the other to ensure that it slides properly and is not uh, hooking. Um, uh, clean the dirt and dust and sand from the window seals, uh, tracks to reduce uh, and the hinges to ensure that it moves properly. One of the problems that sliding window has is that uh, for sliding windows, there are normally small, small rollers that are installed inside the, inside, the, inside the sliding windows and when it sits on the track. So from time to time, when you better you see that that's the windows are getting stiff, that is where the person or the aluminum uh, technician will need to just work on, ensure that the rollers are properly done, uh, fixed and they are aligning properly. And once it's installed back, it will just roll smoothly, except um, those things are not properly done. Once it's properly fixed, uh, the sliding window works very well. And for the uh, casement windows, you just look at the hinges, uh, the ones up and down to ensure that they open properly. For the pivot, you also look at the hinges that are attached on the side to ensure that the pivot opens clean. And also when they're becoming too stiff, uh, you may need to apply a little bit of grease on the window to ensure that it moves smoothly. Uh, timber frame, uh, rot, decay uh, of wood. Uh, normally that's one of the things that happen when you have timber for frames repair, once um, for window repairs. Uh, timber is susceptible to uh, to rot and to decay, especially when it's, when it's exposed to too much water. Where you have that kind of situation, you have to cut out the part that is rot, take it out and fill it up um, uh, with a putty and get a new piece of wood uh, back into that place. Once you do the fitting out with putty, it will join properly and then you paint uh, appropriately and to look good. Uh, window seal can be repaired, especially when it has rotted. Once you take it out, the window seal is, uh, you, only, you always need to ensure that the window seal is, uh, is uh, free from water so that the wood doesn't soak water. Window panels missed up. Formation of condensate inside the sealant cavity. Uh, replace the glazing sealant unit, sorry, or replace the whole window. It depends on uh, how bad it is. Normally windows, they have a, uh, glazing rubbers or sealants that are put around the windows. Uh, once it, the condenses sits in there, after a while, it gets bad. And once it gets bad, you may need to replace uh, that, uh, sealant, that sealant. Or if it's very bad, then you may need to replace the whole window unit, not the frame, just the window. Um, those are a few things that you need to check about windows. For metal windows, uh, metal windows, sometimes for uh, metal windows, depend on the material. If it's not aluminum, if it's zinc or there about it, we corrode especially when you do not maintain it. From time to time, you're supposed to coat out the metal uh, aspect of your window to ensure that it doesn't uh, corrode due to rust um, or probably when you have defective uh, uh, lintels. Um, just maintenance is, is something that you must look at. You must create a routine maintenance list for your windows, check it properly, check it regularly to ensure that all the frames and the working mechanism of the windows are in place uh, so that you can uh, is to ensure that you can prolong the lifestyle of the windows. Doors, 
No, uh, doors is, is that part of the building that gives you access into the building. Uh, windows are for fenestration and for um, uh, ventilation. Doors are for uh, gaining access or entry into a given space uh, or the, the given interior spaces depend on the type of door. Now, you have different types of doors. Doors are used uh, 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 in buildings. They are, they are, the doors are classified into different several types. Sometimes it's based on the placement of the component. Sometimes it's based on the method of construction. Sometimes it is a working operation, the working mechanism of the door itself that gives the door its name. Sometimes it's a construction material that is used that gives the door its name. These are the four different types of uh, classification of doors, which are going to see uh, placement of components. The first one, the first one we have, we have the button and ledge door. If you just look at the picture on the, on the side, you will see ledge and button. It comes from the component. The component is bed, is the ledge and the button. Uh, the next one, you have the button ledge and brace door. We should be all used to this one now in our traditional homes where you have ledge, uh, buttons, and then the brace. The ledge, the button, and then the brace. Uh, the next one, you have the ledge, uh, sorry, the button, the ledge, and the frame. You have the frame around it, you have the buttons, and you have the ledges uh, for the different doors. And the next number four is a combination of everything, button, ledge, brace, and frame. You have the frame round, you have the uh, brace, you have the buttons, and you have the ledge, uh, which is to hold the door in place. That's the, type, that's, um, the four types for the ones that has to do with components. Um, and uh, the, the other type is based on the construction of the door. Uh, you have the frame and panel door, frame and panel door, uh, where this is, if you just look at this diagram here, it just explains that the frame is what is round, and then uh, the panels are the ones that are in the middle. Uh, next one of that, you have the glazed door, glazed door. The glazed door is made of glass. You can see that we are used to that, it's just glazed door. You have the louver door, where you have the either wooden louvers, or glass louvers, or you have uh, metallic louvers. Um, you also have the flush doors, which we are, we are used to in our homes and in our offices. Uh, it's totally uh, done from solid core and the laminate core uh, doors, depending on the type of doors. You have the hollow net, hollow core net cellular doors, which is seen here, and the wired uh, wire gauge wire, wire gauge door. Uh, this is normally used in uh, for uh, probably security areas or there security areas or probably for gardens or just 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 cool areas anyway and that's where you probably use that kind of door types of doors based on the working mechanism uh you have the revolving door like this one you see in the major offices you have the sliding door we already know that you also have the swing doors you don't have single or double swing you have the collapsible steel door we are used to that like the picture you're seeing here and then we have the ruler shutters that we use for store fronts, uh, which we are also used to. And then the types of doors based on the material. You have the mild steel door, mild steel door, corrugated steel, corrugated steel door. You have the hollow uh, metal plate door. This is like security door that holds uh, the glass uh, inside doors. You have the metal. Uh, covered plywood door, like Israeli uh, doors, where you have uh, it's covered in the wood are covered with uh, uh, metal sheets. And then other types of door, you have the French door, aluminium door, you have the uh, door components. If you look at this diagram, you have the door stopper itself, which is normally at the bottom of the door, small component. So when the door opens, it doesn't hit the wall, it just places called the door stopper. You have the lintel. Uh, above the door, the concrete element that is there is called the lintel. And then you have the architrave. The architrave is on the front of the uh, the top uh, finish of the uh, part of the frame. The frame is the one that is inside. The one that is on the wall on the side of the door is uh, architrave, while the door seal is at the bottom, the floor itself of the door, where you have, uh, you could sometimes have a metal sheet there. It's called uh, the the door seal, door repairs.
for door repairs, uh, when the door does not close properly, you check if the door is swelling as a result of very high humidity. Sometimes uh, once doors, the material used for the door, especially for wooden doors, if it's a um, particle board or MDF, if it comes in contact with the water, it swells. So when it swells, after a while, it will not lock properly. So once that happens, uh, you know that you need to change that door because once a uh, particle was swells, there's nothing you can do about it. You need to change it. Even if you dry out the door, the door would have lost this form. Uh, sometimes you need to lift up the door handle uh, when trying to open or close. Uh, check if it is easy, if it works easy. Uh, it means that the hinge, when you lift it up, it means that the hinge is bad. Check for the hinge and adjust it properly. Uh, the door rubbing or sticking on the frames. Once that happens, that may, be, may result to high, maybe as a result of high humidity, uh, you need to just adjust the door properly, check the hinges again, and ensure that it doesn't rub too much on the door. Door does not latch properly. When the door does not sit properly in the frame, uh, it is, these are some of the things that happen. Check the position of the door to ensure that it is not skating out. And um, sometimes a lot of the things that happens to wood door is when the door itself, when it was produced, it did not, the wood was not properly treated. When the wood is not properly treated, once you install the door and the elements of wedging hits that door, especially during the Hamatan period, the door dries out. And when the door starts drying, it begins to take a new shape. It curves in such a manner that it may probably now become difficult for the door to lock. That is when the door is not properly treated or the season of the door is not that's why it's always advisable to ensure that when doors are being produced, especially for those that make doors, they should ensure that the door goes through the whole industrial process to ensure that the wood is properly seasoned and properly dried out to ensure that you don't have issues when you install the door. No matter how the project is in a rush, especially when you are producing door, allow it go through the, allow the wood go through the normal seasoning period or the normal treatment period to ensure that the wood doesn't bulk when the door has been installed. That also goes for every wooden component in the house, that, in, the, in the house, either the doors, the kitchen cabinets, or the wardrobes, or the shelves, or whatever you install. And normally do we have the same problem. Uh, door maintenance tip. Uh, the flush bolts. Flush bolts is normally put at the, at the end of the door, um, or upper on the top or the bottom for wooden doors or aluminum doors, or especially for double doors. On one side of the door, the flush bolt flushes with the, with the with the door itself, it goes in. There's a hole that it goes in up or it goes in down bottom. Sometimes the screw of the flush bolt may lose, uh, may get out of place. Uh, you just need to look at it and tighten it and ensure that that's screwed well, and then the door will be fine. Sometimes the frame of the door normally will have an issue. You probably will just need to inspect it to ensure that uh, it's properly installed and doesn't have issue. Glass lights, for the doors that has glass lights, uh, sometimes the glass may crack or break. When that happens, you change it. Uh, and then if it's not cracking, if it's shaking, you need to check the screws to ensure that it is properly done. Uh, screw checking all, check all the lock, uh, the locks and the opening mechanism. Uh, these are just checklists for maintenance of door, which I think you can copy. You already have the slide. You can look through them. Uh, it will help you through your day-to-day -day maintenance of these different elements of uh, a building, starting from the windows, the doors, uh, that you may check regularly the floors, the walls, and so forth and so forth. Thank you very much. I think that, yes, thank you. That's the last slide. Thank you very much for your time. So I'll take our questions now. Uh, please feel free to ask as much questions as you wish uh, so that we can treat them uh, together. Thank you very much. So I'll take your questions now, please. If you have any questions, please just raise your hand and then we'll be able to take them. Okay, I can see Aziz, please. Aziz, your question? Just unmute yourself and ask your question. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Class. Uh, my question has to do with the mold growing on the wall. I think so, I that, sorry. I, the mold, the mold. Okay, go ahead. So, um, I experienced that a lot in one of my facility. And then uh, we tried to, my plumbers, it due to 
maybe the state of the, the building is about maybe something years old in there in the last 60 years and the pipes are inside the building yeah so you can't even trace where those pipes um were being connected through at that time so and in the last five years the connection we did for one of the rooms is that we, we nailed plywood on the wall and um in that time we're not experiencing modes and once we paint that place we just need to just maintain the wall by either um, um, cleaning the walls or painting uh, as at when do you when uh, rather than our painting policy so is it a good idea so we have, a, we have there's one now that is happening again in another room and we want to repeat the same process this is the one we tried um in the last um, five years worked. So I want to say, if we have mood like that, is it a good thing to to go that route? Okay. Um. Uh, what I'll say to that is, um. Well, you, what you have just done is all called cosmetics. Okay. And then, uh, you have just uh, applied makeup over the problem. You have not actually solved the problem. Um. One of the problems that we normally occur. Uh, when um, you have this kind of thing, is, especially for old buildings, it is very likely that the pipes that was used are the old governized steel pipes. And if these are the old governized steel pipes, the pipes over the years will corrode. And once it corrodes, there will be leakage inside the wall. I don't know if you get that. Yeah, I got that. I got that. Yes, and once that. there is leakage in the wall, you will get moles. No matter, you cannot treat it until you stop the leakage itself. So my advice to you is that first of all, get the get to the problem, and then as much as possible, if it's possible, you will probably plan gradually to change the piping in the house. If it's possible to create docks where those pipes will go through, so that it will make it a lot easier for maintenance. Do that, and then once that is done, you bypass the old pipes and ensure water doesn't go through there. You will discover that the molding will stop, and then. Um, the leakage also will stop in between the walls. You won't need to flood in with wood anymore. And then uh, you're sure you have solved that problem in the way that it should be done professionally. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, another question has to do with the cracks. Tell me. So we renovated, uh, we had an open area that we converted into rooms. Yes. Yeah. Open and converted into rooms. So in my own little experience in construction is that at the point of the joint where you start a block wall by a column, we, we um, they apply a mesh or install a mesh, a mesh there. And what the civil engineers told me then while I was in that project is that they have that mesh there because of, uh, to prevent cracks from occurring at that joint. Just to, so it's on that mesh that they now start applying the plaster, the mortar, sort of. So, but, so on this one that we want to do, we didn't use mesh. I started seeing crack on my wall somehow. So I'm, I'm thinking that like it could is is, it, is that mesh? Yes, is that mesh a solution to avoiding cracks? Aside from what you have mentioned in the course of the discussion. Well, well, uh, what the mesh does is that when the the thickness of the crack. I'm sorry, the thickness of the plaster is much. The mesh helps to bind the plaster together much more. It's just like adding reinforcement to concrete so that by the time there's vibration, it is the mesh that carries it. It's not the concrete, it's not the, it's not the mortar directly that carries that. However, the factors that I had mentioned is when you have a newly finished wall, the quality of sand and the quality of mix also affect it. You have the right quality of sun and you have wrong quality of mix, you have cracks. If you have wrong quality of sun, wrong quality of mix, you have you have cracks. And the cracks are not something really, once it's plaster cracks, it's not something you should be afraid of. It's a lot, it's just for you to uh, scrape and redo, you know, somehow. Uh, but the, the you need to ensure that you use the right mix for that. But the what the what the mesh, the, the mesh also helps. Uh, it's not it's not everywhere that you will use mesh. It's only where it has special effect that you use mesh. And sometimes there's all called bonding agents that we normally use. 
uh, we apply to the surface. So if there's an existing concrete surface, you first of all tyrolene. Uh, once you do the tyrolene, you now apply the uh, the bonding agent on that surface of, uh, of of the wall before you now add your new wall to it, so that it also helps the bonding between the old and the new wall that is coming in. Uh, well, also you are using the the uh, the mesh also helps to re to reduce the movement that happens within it within the wall. You, you either use um, the metallic mesh or there's what we call net. There's a net that is normally used for POP. You can also use it for those areas. So you just lay it on it and plaster over. It also helps to keep and bond that uh, plaster together. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, more questions, please. Okay, Okbe, let's take your question. Okay. okay, sir. My own question is on this um, wall maintenance. Um, there was a place I was managing before, and we are having this kind of wall flaking and shocking. So I have advised them to do vetting. You understand? To do what? In, uh, vetting. No, I didn't get that. Vetting, vetting. These are uh, in water resistance membrane. Okay, felting. So, uh, vetting. So okay. we have done it, but yet we are still experiencing um, that flaking, that wall flaking. So I don't know what can I advise my client. I don't know what to do about it because it has been something I've been experiencing year by year when there is rainy, the flaking, flaking we started and it always causes a lot of argument. So I don't know what to do about it again. So I'm just seeking for your advice now. What can I advise them? Or okay, what like, I, like, I, like I was trying to tell us is you, you have not solved the problem. You are just trying to do cosmetics. There is a cause of the problem. There is something that is making that wall, that wall damp. And it's very possible, it's very, it's very, sorry, it's very important for you to go to the, there's what we call root cause analysis. Go to the root cause of that problem, of causing that damp. Isolate that problem. Once you isolate the problem, it is from there the other solution can begin to happen. Look for the leakages. Look for where that wall is getting wet from. Try as much as possible to stop that dab from coming in. Either it's coming from on top or from below. Isolate it and stop it. Once you stop that, one of the things you are doing is not just by if you apply felt on a wall, it won't do much. Is um, is you need to stop the problem first. You can either use felt or use a um, bitumen, raw bitumen to paint it. After you have used bitumen to paint it. Once that is done and is properly uh, dried up, you use an undercoat to resurface it. You un use undercoat to resurface it before you paint. The undercoat will also help to ensure that you don't have flaking on the wall again. Thank you, sir. Yep. Please, more questions. Please let's ask our questions or please well, from whatever uh, whatever issues you are having with the buildings you are maintaining or the sites you are working in, uh, let's discuss it together. Okay, I, I think I can see blessing. Blessing, let's take a question. Good evening, sir. Thank you for the class. Good evening, everybody. Okay, I think I've mentioned this before previously with Mr. Paul, but um, in my current site, there's actually a moist wall from the, let's say from the ninth floor straight down to the garage. And then um, every time we try to look for a solution for it, it there is no place that we can know where the leakage is coming from. So, um, so the only thing we do just to make them, we just create the parts, use filler on it, like we prep it and oh, then give it time, those places will become moist again, like very moist, straight down or looking for a way to trace down. So we did one, actually they called them the, the construction people 
and they said um, they've done it. So raining season came last year and um, it became moist again. So okay. now they say we should just abandon the place and um, maybe another rainy season this year because they say they've traced it. They don't know if it's a leaking um, plumbing. They don't know if it's a plumbing issue. They, um, they just don't know where the leakage is coming from. So they want to trace it. So for now, they say we should just leave it like that while the place is still moist. All we, all, all we do for that particular floor on the left wing, we have to just create it and just let it be like that. No painting, no repainting, no nothing, because every time we repaint, it just go moist again. So they say we should leave it that way and wait for a rainy season to see if they can trace it from where the issue is coming from. So that is just the challenges we have on my own part. Okay, uh, let me try and, um, for what you have said, I, I can't really, can really get to uh, pick out what the exact problem will be, but um, um, I'll just talk from my experience also on managing um, um, these kind of issues. Um, one of the questions I'll ask, do you have the as -but drawing of the Sorry, I didn't get that. Do you have the as -but drawings of the building? Yes, we do. We have like a blueprint of it. Okay. Um, not just the architectural. Do you have the plumbing drawings? Well, since I'm not the facility manager there, we were just like like an officer, not we are just like working for the landlord just to make sure like the building is growing on and all. So we don't have like we don't have like all the details we need to know. We just wait for maybe when they do their inspection and they tell us what we need okay, to know. Okay, I'm afraid so it's it will be difficult. Okay, you now go and check. Uh, okay, I get it. But anyway, for for you that is doing like a supervisory work over, you may need to yeah. call for these drawings uh, so that you can exactly see where um, the clothes. One one of the things I normally tell. Um, um, People, when it comes to issues like this, is that um, you should always check around where you have the water areas, where there are the, the, the toilets, the kitchen, and every source of water to the to the building, where is where is located. Um, once you that's where should be your first point of call, and start tracing from there. You it may not it doesn't matter where the leakage is showing from, where the wall is. Trace all the bathrooms, trace all the kitchens where you have all the water uh, coming in, where you have rainwater down pipes, go there to ensure that those things are not leaking. And if you find any form of any form of leakage, try and sort those ones and ensure it is isolated. Sometimes water travels in between slab. Water travels through electrical pipes to where you do not understand where. And this kind of thing is it's probably like that, where the water will just be going through the electrical pipe and just be gradual. It's, it may also be AC condensate pipe. It, when um, it will just be leaking inside the wall and it doesn't happen, it is not something that you will see. No, 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 it takes time. It may take like almost two, three months for you to be, before the wall will get soaked again, for you to see. That's the way AC, when it comes to AC or those mini, if it's a um, water supply, you will see it almost immediately. But once it is, is um, drain pipes or down pipes, soil pipes, that's the one that comes gradually. It will just be taking its time to come gradually. Once you're able to isolate those problems uh, and watch, um, use the demofire on that wall, watch it out and see if it dries out. And then you can begin to provide a solution on that. But apart from what I have mentioned now, um, it's something that one, we need to fiscally see to be able to advise you appropriately on what I think the problem is. But those are normally my first point of call. Check all those areas. I'm waiting those areas are done. Check that we don't have capillary rise coming from the bottom. Since it's on the ninth floor, it's very unlikely that it's going to be coming from the foundation or travel all the way to the ninth floor. So it's going to be coming from up down. So you also need to check that or check from the eighth or sixth floor uh, going up and down. Uh, it may be that problem coming from all those. But there must be a pipe in the wall that is causing that leakage. Either if you have checked all the plumbing pipes and there's none there, then you should begin to check the electrical pipes and the AC condensate pipes. And I'm sure that you'll be able to isolate the problem. If it doesn't come from there, then it probably will come from the rainwater uh, down pipes. If the rainwater gutters, uh, that pipe, you have that from the gutters. If they are blocked, sometimes after a while, water will start seeping into the wall and then it will flood that wall. So you need to check that. And once you have tried all this out, uh, I'm sure you have uh, 
a solution around that area. I hope thank I'm you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for your input. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Okay, if there's no other question, um, we'll call it a day now. Uh, like I said earlier, you can, if, you, if while you are working and you think you require any assistance or you have any buzzing question, please reach out to the admin team, give them the question and they'll pass it on to us and we'll be able to send you uh, answers or, or whatever solutions that will be able to address your problem. And if there are areas where we probably need to, to help or visit out your site and give you a little bit of solution. We'll, we'll try and schedule that if it's within our cashment area and we'll be there. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And I hope you learned one or two things today again. Uh, do have a blessed weekend and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. God bless you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, very much, Sam. Good night. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Yeah, good night. My elderly friend.